I'd like to just uh, mention a couple of things to you. Um, first of all, I'd like for you to be in prayer for the Middle East and be in prayer for our troops that are being deployed right now and um, going to, many of them, to Iraq and other nations. Uh, we found out this morning that um, one of the military posts in Kenya uh, was attacked. We need to be in prayer, right? A lot of stuff brewing. We don't want a war. Everybody say, no war. My God, we don't need a war. And so we're praying that God will help us there. Also, last week, I just want to mention this. There was this tragic shooting in Fort Worth. We need to be praying for the survivors and also the, uh, the victims of a, a church shooting that took place there. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to, um, to say to our security team, thank you all so much. Uh, I, uh, I hope that the words that I say right now will give you a little bit of a, a, a security, and that is that we have a great security team. And uh, they're, they're well uh, organized, and they're also very well trained. Uh, most of them come out of either military or some kind of law enforcement. And some of them have identification, some of them don't. But they know what to do in, in the case that we have a problem, so I thank God for them. Third thing I want to say is we, we need to be praying for America and the church in America really praying for the church, unchurched. You know, there are millions of unchurched people in America, thousands of unchurched people around us. That bugs me. Uh, the biblical word for it is I have a burden for that, but it bugs me to see that happening. And I, I, I travail over that. One good thing, you'll see it on the pickup here, is that, you know, a lot of people say negative things about the church, but last New Year's Eve in Atlanta, the bigger dome there, the Mercedes-Benz dome, 65,000 college students got together and worshiped the new year in. And I'm grateful to see things like that happening. Also, just want to mention, once again, the prayer and fasting. And we'll be here at 5.30 every morning. Delia and I will have the coffee on and the fireplace on. And we're just going to gather out here in the lobby. We're going to pray. And it'd be a delight to see as many people as can come. We set it at 5.30 for all of you who get up early and go to work early. So now you can set your alarm at 4 o'clock instead of 5 o'clock and come and pray. And then also, just mentioning to you, our life group leaders, uh, if you are presently a life group leader, if you're planning to, past and, and, and present and planning to, please go online and sign up. We need you to sign up so we'll know uh, who is, um, who's planning to be a part of, uh, of leading a life group. We have wonderful life groups, and we want more. And so uh, that's something that's, that's uh, on my hard lot. I'm, I'm highly involved in that. I give leadership to our life group leaders because I believe that they're an extension of the pastoral ministry of, of the church. And so uh, excited about this new semester that will start in February. Having said all of that, everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good. Y'all know how to do that. Yeah. You know, that's pretty good for a bunch of ex-Baptists and Catholics and Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and, and one or two Charismatics sprinkled in there. Just say, praise the Lord again. Praise the Lord. Oh, it makes me feel right at home. That's what we always used to say in my home church when I was a kid when we didn't know what else to say. We just say, praise the Lord. Okay, let me go on. Starting off with a new series today uh, called Vision 2020. I know that that's not too uh, creative of a title, but it's still, it's uh, 2020 is what we're looking at. And I, I want to uh, share with you a little bit about prayer and fasting this morning and some of the other things that are, are from God's word having to do with drawing near to him. Several years ago, uh, there was a book that came out called The Power of Vision. And many of you have read that book. It was by George Barna, who is a church strategist and a, uh, a statistician. And he wrote a wonderful book. And he said this. He said that uh, a vision is a God-given, clear picture of a preferred future. And I just like that uh, because it has in it the idea of hope and fulfillment and a future and, um, and, and, and possibility. 
And then he goes on to say that in the book that a vision is not fulfilled just simply by dreaming about it. Because God can give a vision. That doesn't mean it's going to come to pass, does it? In the Old Testament, he told Israel, I'm going to do a lot of this for you. And a lot of those things never came to pass because they never embraced it. And so that's why the Bible says that he gave them as an example to us on whom the ends of the world have come. But he says that it's not just dreaming about it, but it's taking incremental steps, purposeful steps toward a desired goal. And sometimes that means that we change, we have to change what we're doing. Y'all know what the, the definition of insanity is, right? All of you know. My definition of insanity is repeating that worn out cliche once again, so I'm not going to do it. Um, but anyway. But here's what I see when I'm, I'm where I'm standing. I'm 70 years old. I'm an older guy. I'm not an old man. I'm an older guy. Everybody say older. Thank you. That's what I was saying about myself. But here's what I see. I see uh, not only a new year, but I see a new decade. And we stand on the precipice of a brand new decade. And I'm excited about this decade. I believe that it's got great possibilities. It's going to be one of the most wonderful and productive and fulfilling decades of my life. In fact, the most by the grace of God. I want that to happen. My expectations are high. So we're at the end, we're at the beginning of uh, I'm looking ahead because I feel like I feel like I'll be here ten years from now. I really might not be right here, but I'll be here. I'll be around. But I've, I've got 120 months ahead. I I, I I use the calculator and put all this together. I have 520 weeks, 3,650 days. I'm doing good, aren't I? 87,600 hours. And I've got about 5,256,000 million, I mean, 5 million, yeah, 256,000 minutes. So what will I do with that time? What will we do with the time that is given to us? It's the most precious commodity that God could give to us is this commodity of time. And what will we do with it? And what will God do? What is God going to do in our lives in the next few years? What's God going to do in your life? These are things that we want to open up our heart. That's why we're praying this week. We're, getting, we're devoting seven days to prayer and fasting because we are praying, God, open our eyes that we might be able to see, open our ears that we may be able to hear. Let me give you some facts about our church uh, this, past, this past year. And I realize we are not a mega church. We're a relatively, we're a small to medium-sized church. And so the facts that I'm giving to you are very honest. They're very straightforward. Uh, one thing that we try to do is never try to build ourselves up bigger than we are, make it look, make ourselves look like we're something that we're not. But let me give to you some facts, and and these are these are good things. But over the past 12 months, over 1,200 people have attended uh, some kind of event here at Christ Family Church. Out of that number, there's 450 who consider themselves to be a member of the church. There are 160 on our dream team. That's our serve team. Uh, there are 210 giving units. That would be families, that would be some couples, as well as individuals. So I would imagine out of that, probably about 300 people who are givers on a, um, uh, on a regular basis or at least on a, a semi-regular basis the ministry. And something I don't think that I put up here was the, uh, the amount that was given this last year. We don't have a business meeting every year, so this is it. So listen up. This is my business meeting to you. But if you are a tithing member at Christ Family Church, you can ask for a, a comprehensive report and we'll let you know. Marlene will give you a report on our, our giving. But uh, th those people, 210 people, have given this year uh, 500 and $73,000. Now, that is not a lot of money. I'm telling you what I'm praising God for. It It has sustained us. It's kept us going. It's kept us moving in the right direction. And the day could come, the day could come, when somebody would stand here at Christ Family Church and say, this year, it was 12,000 people 
who were participants in activities here at the church or came and worshiped with us, or 4,500 members, or that we have 1,600 people on our dream team, or 2,000 givers, and our budget is six or seven million. And we've been there before, and we know what that's like. We know what that takes, because it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes by constant and consistent development of ministry. And many of you have been there. You've been part of churches that large and even larger. And there are churches in our community that are that large as well. But what happens is we don't, we don't get there by focusing on numbers, folks. We don't do that. We get there by focusing on doing the right thing today. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning, is just simply doing the right thing today. And then there is another reality, and, uh, and it comes from 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. The Apostle Paul says, for great and effective, everybody say effective. See, that's a great and effective door is open for us as we desire to uh, touch our world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, the door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. A lot of possibilities, but a lot of challenges too. So I'm not here to hype you up about this year or about this decade. Because then we're not faced with easy stuff. I'm here to tell you that what we face in the future is not for the wimps. It's for the faithful. It's for people who will put their faith in him. So it's not a, necessarily a rosy picture from, you know, from a human standpoint. How many of you know we don't look at things from the human standpoint? We look at it from God's standpoint. And no matter what takes place, he is in charge. So do you have a dream today? Do you have a vision? I hope you do. I hope you have not only the vision that meshes with the corporate vision of the body of Christ, but I hope you have a personal vision in your life. This is what I would like to accomplish in the days that are ahead. And if you don't, Find out those things. I, the, God doesn't hide stuff from us. He will drop something in your heart for tomorrow. Well, we can be bigger. We can be better in every area of our lives. But those dreams that we seek to see happen are not fulfilled by just determination and strategy and, and, and bulldozing, you know, joining, uh, call it the white knuckle club. We just grab hold and say, we're going to do this no matter what. But we do it by doing the right thing. And we do it by doing the right thing now. Because that's part of that incremental step. What, what can I do today to help me reach God's goal for my life? It's like a new baby. By the way... We have some new babies being born into the church. I uh, told uh, Mr. Reeves back here on the way up, I can't wait to hold that new baby. Because they have such cute babies. Y'all need to have about 16. Uh, go home and tell Mackenzie that. She'll probably slap you and then come and slap me afterward. There's an amazing thing about babies. They have growth and development built into them. It's innate. All you have to do, not all you have to do. But I mean, if we feed them and if we nurture them and if we clean them up and give them a bath and take care of them, they will grow. We don't make that happen. They grow when we do the right thing. It's the same way in the kingdom of God. And so when the Corinthian church was arguing over, you know, who should get the credit for the growth? Who should get credit for all of this? The Apostle Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 3, I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Everybody say, God gave the increase. He does. So increase is not our problem. Growth is not our problem. Planting and watering is. And that set me free one time. Because, you know, I really, but some people are great evangelists. I mean, they can just sit down with people and lead them to Christ. They can get up and preach fireball sermons and people just feel, you know, just come to Jesus. And I wanted to be that so bad. I wanted to be that fireball evangelist that kind of, you know, would come in and people would say, ooh, 
the evangelist is here. You know, black suit, black tie, black shoes, black hair. Never, I had the black suit, but I couldn't manage the black hair thing. And there's not too much fireball about me. And uh, so I would invite people to come to Jesus, and they would just sit there. I just, I want to be that. And then people would say, Paul, you really are a pastor. Make me so mad I didn't want to be a pastor. Pastors are boring. What are my children going to say when they have to go to school? What does your, your dad do? He's a pastor. Oh, man, how boring could that be? Of course, Juliet figured it out when she was about six years old. She went to school, and different ones in the school came in and introduced themselves as to what they did. And one came in, he was the custodian. He had on these overalls. She came home. I was working at the church in my overalls. And she said, Daddy, now I know. You know, it just thrilled her that she could ascribe an occupation to me. She said, Dad, now I know what you are. You're a custodian. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm a custodian. Pastors do a little bit of everything, don't they? But I found this. I have my place. And my place usually is not just planting, but it's watering. You know, um, just touch on this briefly. Our four purposes at Christ Family Church are this, and you hear this a lot, and that is we want to help people meet God, find freedom, discover purpose, impact our world. And so each Sunday during January, we're going to be touching on one of these and also just forecasting some vision on how those things can be accomplished. And today I want to talk about meeting God, that aspect of our purpose, that aspect of our vision. And this is our faith declaration, and that is this, I will draw nearer to God. So if you're jotting that down, uh, that'd be good. Why, why, why draw near to God? I mean, that's a good question. Because God is here. So how do we draw near to him? And why should we even draw near to God? Because the fact is, is that he is present. However, the fact that God is present does not necessarily mean that I'm fulfilling all and enjoying all of the presence, presence of God in my life. He can be present and we cannot know his presence. And so then when we talk about drawing near to God, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's walking in the fullness of his presence, or at least moving in a degree, and, and we can do that. This is something that this year you and I can do. We can draw nearer to him. Let me give you some New Testament passages that just vindicate this word. Hebrews, the seventh chapter says, for the law never made anything perfect. because It just, it just was powerless. But now... We have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. So now we have a hope through which we draw near to God. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Again, let us, everybody say it, draw near. Say, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. So the drawing near under the new covenant is actually being able to come to him with the assurance that, yeah, he's there. Yeah, he's drawing near to us as well. James 4, beginning with verse 7. Powerful passage here. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God. Draw near to God. And God will come close to you. Wow. You mean there's a way that I can make the God of the universe, the one who's in charge of all of this, to actually draw near to me? Yeah. By drawing near to him. That when I take that step, he takes that step back. And you know what? I found that his step is so much bigger than my step. I would challenge you to pray a prayer. I would challenge you to pray a prayer. Come, Lord, and fill my life with your fullness. I challenge you to do that. It is impossible for you to pray that prayer in sincerity 
without a visitation from God. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit as a young teenager, I was really all alone when it happened. And I set my heart to come near to him. It was on a Thursday night, and I was praying for my sister who had encephalitis, been hospitalized for six weeks in hospital 70, years, 70 miles away. But I'll never forget getting down and saying, God, I want the real thing. I look at the scripture, and I see how these people lived, and I don't have that, but I want that. And that night, a simple prayer, Lord, I draw near to you. And when I drew near to him, I'm telling you what, the floodgates of heaven opened up. And I found out that my drawing near did not even compare to his drawing near. And amazing stuff happened. So come close to God. God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Ouch. Because, by the way, James is talking to the church, you know. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. We don't read these passages too often, do we? Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. We're talking about drawing close to him. Now in verse 13, he shows us something else that is a part of this drawing near to God, doing the right thing today. And that is, he said, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town, and we will stay there a year, and we will do business there, and we will make a profit. How do you know what your life will be tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It is here a little while and then it's gone. You know, pastor, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of faith stuff. You know, you need to embrace the promises of God. Get out there and declare them and say, bless God, I don't care what happens. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. James says, who do you think you are when you do that? He says, what you ought to say is this. If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this, and do that. I showed you some statistics a few minutes ago. I talked about the future a few moments ago. But I'm going to tell you right now, all of that is in the Lord's hand. Every, every, and, and everything in your family, and everything in your personal life, all of that is in the Lord's hand. You and I cannot make any of this happen. We can invite it to happen, because God has spoken it. But God fulfills whatever his word is, not what our word is. So it's, a, it's not name it and claiming it. It's naming it and asking him for it, to put his claim on it. And claiming what he has named, I guess, would be the best way to put it. So he says, otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting, he says, is evil. Remember it is a sin uh, to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So there's a lot here, stuff we don't hear a whole lot about. That's the thing about humbling ourselves. I'm just going to say, this one's for free. We won't take up another offering for this one. Just let me tell you, if you're faced with some major obstacles in your life right now, try that one first, just to humble yourself. Wash your hands, he says, your actions, the things that you do. Cleanse your, cleanse your heart. You're, you're living in division. Your loyalties are divided between what the world is saying you ought to do and what God says that you ought to do. Be sorrowful and grieve. You know, there's a point where we do that. We don't know what holds tomorrow. He says all of this. We're arrogant when we are following our own plans. And we're sinning when we know really what we ought to do, but we don't do it. So this is one of the reasons why we're devoting this first full week of 2020 to fasting and prayer. I believe that when God's people cry out corporately, God moves. So this is a key to drawing closer to God. 
Let me talk to you about fasting. Fasting is simply, is simply this. It's refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Now, I know that there are other things that you can fast. You can fast playing video games. You can fast, I don't know, going to the shooting gallery. You can fast watching Hallmark movies or something like that, which I, I've done. It was a sacrifice, but I managed to do it. <laughs> Not biblical fasting. Biblical fasting is refraining from food. It's not just for those who are spiritual, super spiritual. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not, believe me. The reason why I fast is because I am not that spiritual. <laughs> if I were super spiritual, maybe I wouldn't. It's not starving or dieting or going on a hunger strike. I'm just not going to eat any food until this happens or that happens. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. But it's a normal part of a Christ follower's life. That's what it is. Because Jesus said that it was. So fasting, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. I'm sorry about it. I'm just going to tell you right now. Fasting, everybody say, this is not easy. Because I know this, that when, uh, when, uh, when I tell my stomach, okay, you're going to remain empty, my stomach grumbles back at me in retaliation. So it's not easy. It's not for the weak. It's not for uh, the spineless. And you really can't put a huge upbeat on, on this. Uh, you can't make this thing called fasting. You can't make it cool and sexy. It's just not. I know every church in America do that. 21 days of prayer and fasting. We shortened it to seven days because I want everybody to be involved. We started at 40 days. And... Lord knows nobody wanted to do that. We'd have three people in the church come in. They could, their clothes would not stay on them after 40 days because they lost so much weight. I remember one guy So we're going on a 40-day fast. He said, okay, brand new Christian. He came in after about two weeks. I said, man, what's going on? He said, well, I'm fasting. And he hadn't eaten anything. And I said, well, you might better drink a little bit of orange juice or something. Something's going on with you. Anyway, we have a brochure to help you out a little pamphlet that will help you in getting some, um, some direction on, on fasting. You can pick up one of those and see it online. But there's no way that you can make this thing cool and it, 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 oh, job, we're doing a 21-day fast. Um, it's not for that. But it's for this. It's one of those spiritual disciplines that Jesus gave to us. And I, I'm challenging you to do it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm challenging you to fast on some level. Maybe a meal a day, maybe two meals a day. It may be just drinking juices. It may be eating kale for a week. Oh, oh, oh. does not sound great. But the purpose for that is, is to put ourselves in a sacrifice, in a sacrificial mode, which through the mystery of God, gives the opportunity for God to speak to us like he never has before. And he will do it. So it's not easy, but it's out there. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, look at this. He talks about spiritual disciplines, giving and prayer and fasting. And then he says in verse 17, when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast, don't, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, disheveled. I don't even know how to say that word. I'm sorry. English teacher, help me out there. Thank you. I appreciate that help. So people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. This is the only reward they'll ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, and put a toothpick in your mouth, as somebody said. And then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. There's going to be a reward. There's going to be an answer. There are some things that never happen in our lives unless we say, yes, God, I'm going to do this. Matthew, the ninth chapter. This was a life-changing thing for me because it helped me to understand under the new covenant what it means to draw near to God. 
One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast? Because we fast, disciples of John, we're his followers, and the Pharisees fast. So he put themselves in the same camp as the old school of thinking. We all fast, you don't. And Jesus says, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But, when, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, this is the part that set me free. Who would patch old clothing with a new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from pressure, spilling the wine, ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that they are both preserved. And what this helped me to see was to differentiate between religious fasting and spiritual fasting. Religious fasting is a ritual. It's a duty. It's an obligation. Somebody died, so we all fasted for three days. There's a certain time, every Friday maybe, we eat fish. It's religious fasting. I'm obeying the rules of the church. I'm doing this from time to time. I am fulfilling my obligation, however great or how little it may be. That's religious fasting, and that's old wineskin thinking. But new wineskin thinking is fasting for a purpose. It's got a reason to it. And the reason is not just to fulfill a duty, but there's a spiritual pursuit involved in this. Something will happen as a result of my fasting. So when he talks about these spiritual principles of praying and giving and fasting, see, there's, it's like in praying, there's a difference in saying your prayers and praying. See, we don't say our prayers anymore, do we? We pray. So we don't just say our prayers. Have you said your prayers today? Have you said your prayers? Have you done your Bible reading? Have you said your prayers? That, that, that's obligation. That is duty. Well, I say my prayers every day. That's not what it's all about. It's about praying. Uh, when we give, we give with purpose. There's a difference in tipping God and doing, you know, a little of that and tithing to God. There's a difference in giving alms, uh, you know, giving alms to the church, or whatever, and giving tithing. Because when you tithe, you give with purpose. Because it's when you give with purpose that God says the reward is coming. It becomes a part of your life. Prayer becomes a part of your life. Not because you're fulfilling a religious goal or obligation, but because there's purpose to it. And so the fasting is the same way. And so this week, as we fast together, I believe that God is going to open brand new doors that we have never, never seen before. Would you agree with me uh, today for that? God is going to open up the windows of heaven. God is going to open up the doors. God's going to open up possibilities. God's going to, God's going to break through. Uh, how many of you have a business and you really need the Lord to break through in that business? How many of you have a, a family situation, maybe a marriage or whatever? You really need a breakthrough. Yeah. How many have uh, wayward children? You want them to come back to the Lord, yeah. And we're praying about the nations. We're praying about the church in America. We're praying about a lot of stuff. I can, can you imagine that? And the thing about it is, is you never know what's happening when you draw near to him. Have absolutely no idea the massive, incredible return on that simple step of drawing near to him. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you have given to us as your people this amazing opportunity to draw near to you. 
I thank you that uh, every time that we have set our hearts to do so, you have done an amazing thing. And Lord, sometimes uh, we don't even see, see it immediately, but we know that we're setting the stage for the future outpouring and reward that comes. But today, Lord, I ask not for us, and I ask for me. I ask, Lord, for those who are in need today. We lift up our world to you. We lift up our nation to you, Lord. We lift up those who are around us. We lift up our neighbors. We lift up the ones who are unchurched. Lord, we call the prodigals back home. Those who have not uh, even been in fellowship for a long time and so need to to come to you and come back to you. Lord, we lift them up to you. And we thank you today, Lord God, that as we set our hearts to corporately seek your face, you're going to do mighty things, and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed, if you would, for a moment. And let's just uh, let's pray a prayer. I'd like to ask everybody to pray this prayer together. It's a prayer of commitment to him. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and I give you that opportunity to do so today. But as we pray, let this be your prayer of entrance into a new life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all pray it together. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world and giving your life for me. And today, Lord, I give you my life. Come and live within me. Be my Lord. Thank you for your saving grace. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins. Today, Lord God, I pray as I position myself in your kingdom and as you draw me to yourself that I will fulfill your will. Let your will be done in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.